Thank you. Let me welcome everyone here today to uh, the Cold War Studies seminar here at the Davis Center of Harvard University. Um, today, we're going to be discussing this book from Warsaw with Love, and the subtitle of it will give the title itself may not um, convey the substance of the book, but the the subtitle Polish Spies, the CIA, and the Forging of an Unlikely Alliance does. Um, the book is an unusual one in that it uh, the origin or impetus for it was a landmark article published by the author of this book, John Pomfret, whom I'll introduce in a second. But um, that article appeared in the Washington Post in 1995, and it traced what was an extraordinary story of the Polish intelligence services cooperation with the CIA to rescue US uh, intelligence agents who had been trapped behind Iraqi lines in 1990, 91, when after Iraq uh, invaded Kuwait. And the, uh, the story of how those agents were rescued, plus other um, extremely interesting information about the Polish intelligence services cooperation was told in that article and has been expanded here. But this book also covers a much wider swath of history. It looks at the intelligence dimension of US-Polish relations after 1989. Poland was officially a member of the Warsaw Pact until mid-1991, but de facto, it had already changed its ties. It had already decided to align itself with the West, with NATO, and with, above all, with the United States early on after 1989. So, this book uh, expands on that and looks at the travails and achievements of Poland after 1989, covering almost 30 years, uh, or actually 30 years or so. Um, and because the intelligence dimension is was important in Polish politics, especially in the 1990s, but even afterward as well, the book inevitably deals uh, quite a bit with some of the ups and downs of the Polish political scene. And um, again, fascinating details about how the intelligence services got embroiled that way and got manipulated in some ways for the political ends of key politicians. I won't say more about the book now, except to urge people who want to uh, really read a riveting story. The book is relatively brief, um, but it, uh, extremely well written. And so you will find, um, almost anyone will find something of great interest in it, uh, even those who may not know much about Poland or about intelligence. So let me um, then briefly introduce, we're gonna be having two speakers today. The first is John Pomfret, who is the author of the book and um, was long while a, reporter and editor at the uh, Washington Post, one of the greatest newspapers in the world. And he um, is writer, as this book and earlier books on China attest, and he has been stationed in numerous posts abroad and has reported uh, you know, extensively on China as well. So he um, is really a, a good person to take up this topic in a way that makes sense of what could otherwise have been a tangled web for most uh, journalists seeking to figure out what was going on in Polish politics and the intelligence relationship at the time. The other speaker um, is a colleague of my colleague and friend of mine here at the uh, Davis Center. Uh, that is Thomas Simons, who was the key thing to mention for today's talk is that he was ambassador, US ambassador to Poland during the early phase of what this book covers. And he had been a, uh, a longtime State Department official responsible for policy to an Eastern Europe and the Soviet Union. And then he became ambassador in, uh, under George H.W. Bush and then uh, later on served as U.S. ambassador to Pakistan. But the relevant 
question for today with regard to Tom is that he uh, was ambassador to Poland during the early phase. He, he also has PhD from Harvard and uh, has written himself a very interesting history of Eastern Europe. So let me, with that, turn to John. John will speak for uh, 25, 30 minutes, and then Tom will offer his commentary, and then we'll open it up. Please feel free, in the meantime, as the seminar proceeds to submit questions, and I will do my best to get to them. Um, I, we, you can submit those either via Zoom or through um, YouTube. Thank you. Uh, please, John. Thank you, Mark, and uh, thank you for having me uh, at, the, at the center today. I've really um, been looking forward to this. So I want to talk basically about why or how I wrote this book a little bit. And hopefully through that story, I will can kind of fill in some of the backstory of this remarkable alliance that the Polish intelligence officers and the CIA forged together. So I was hired by the Washington Post in 1992, basically to go to what remained of Yugoslavia and write about the destruction of that country during the civil war, mostly in Bosnia and mostly in Sarajevo, the capital. Um, I had done a bunch of war coverage before with the Associated Press and the Washington Post was having difficulty finding volunteers to go to, to war-torn Bosnia to cover, the, to cover the war. And so they basically found me, hired me, actually in an interview when I was in Afghanistan of all places uh, and sent me to Bosnia. But at the time, the Post uh, Bureau in uh, Eastern Europe was still in Warsaw, basically a throwback to the era when Warsaw was sort of the crucible of, of Eastern developments in Eastern Europe. Just some, some of you might remember the Solidarity Trade Union and the push against communism in the 1980s, which was uh, met with a crackdown of, of martial law. But in 89, Poland had made a transition to the Republic of Poland with semi-free elections. So Poland was already on this tra trajectory of joining the West, if you will, both in terms of a, a liberal uh, market economy and, and a democratic political situation. So there was stability in Poland, but there was chaos in Sarajevo. And basically, I was sent to Sarajevo. But we, I had a house in Warsaw. So every sort of Two months or so, I would be allowed on rest in R and R back back to Poland. And I'd write an occasional story about Polish politics, the fact that bananas had shown up on the streets in Warsaw, et cetera, as a sign of its changes. And then I would go back to Bosnia and kind of to deal with the the issues of snipers and artillery shells, et cetera. And along about 1994, I began to pick up this. Room, these rumors in Poland that the Poles had done the United States a great favor in Iraq in 1990. And I couldn't really confirm it. I didn't really know what the rumors were about, but I just was told that they'd done a significant favor for America. And so on my rest and relaxation trips back to Warsaw, I began to try to figure out what this was. And at the time, the Post had a marvelous translator and fixer by the name of Halina Potoczka. And she su suggested speaking with the managers of Polish state-owned construction companies, because at the time the Poles had operated across the Middle East in terms of development projects, building roads, building sewage treatment plants, et cetera. And upwards of several thousand Polish construction workers had been working in Iraq. And if the Poles ever wanted to embed a spy uh, in any community, that would be the smart place to look. And there were 14 such companies. And so we began to interview them. Again, I was sort of shuttling back between Sarajevo and Warsaw. And we got to 13 and all of them said they'd never heard of anything, of, of you know, anything happening. We, they didn't know what I was talking about. And so we finally got to the 14th. And the, the manager of the 14th company basically said, yeah, you know, we actually had this crazy engineer named Eugenius. And Eugenius told us this wacky story about how we were involved, our company was involved in moving six American spies out of Iraq to safety in Turkey. But we never believed them in any way. He's retired and he lives in Western Poland. And so Helena Potoczka finds Eugenius in Western Poland and we go to Western Poland, we interview him and he tells his story and I write up the story and there's this kind of, uh, I, I print out his printout and the printout's about this long because the time printers didn't cut between page, they didn't know pagination at the time. That sort of dates us, but that's life. And we faxed the facts again, dating us. We faxed this massively long page of information to the spokesperson's office of the UOP, which at the time was the Polish intelligence agency. 
And within an hour, I get a phone call in the bureau in Warsaw demanding that I show up at the UOP's offices. And so I, we drive down to, to downtown Warsaw and there's this Stalinist era building, the high ceilings and that, that worn in red carpet and you go through one door after another, after another, and after they're finally going through a final door on the, on the door, you, I, I read the title director. The door opens and there's this massive desk and behind this massive desk is this looming presence of this, this character with piercing blue eyes and pencil thin mustache about six, four, he has his, my fax rolled up in his hand and he's shaking it at me. And he goes, I am Gromosław Czempinski. I am the director of the intelligence services of Poland and you are in possession of state secrets. I could have you arrested. And that begins this decades long friendship I had with Gromik Czempinski. And over the course of the next few months, while I'm shuttling back and forth between Warsaw and Sarajevo, we work out the terms on which I could write this story about what the Poles did for the United States in terms of exfiltrating six American officers. Actually, it was a CIA station chief, three commuter, communicators from the NSA, and two American military officers from Iraq to safety to Warsaw and then back to the United States. That story appears on the front page of the Post in January 1995. Time passes, I go to China, Poland enters NATO in 1999. But I always thought that this story could make a kernel of a really interesting book, but I had no idea what the backstory was. And actually, obviously no idea what the front story was, what happened after that. Um, so, and I, and I was obviously maintaining, trying to do the best I could, maintaining close relations with Gromek Czempinski, but he was reluctant to tell the story until 2015, when the situation changed significantly, the political situation changed significantly in Poland, when the Law and Justice Party wins the parliamentary election. And the Law and Justice Party was led by people who had been involved in the Solidarity Trade Union movement somewhat. But these people had a very different vision of what Poland should have done once communist, communism ended. And their vision was that basically all communists should be punished by, uh, by the current, by the Polish government for actually participating in that type of a government. And so they carried out uh, programs like cutting the pensions of all people who had worked in the security services, including Poland's foreign spies to a below poverty level uh, level. Uh, and at that point, Czempinski became emboldened to try to basically push back at this at this, what he believed to be an unfair treatment of both him and, and, and spies like him by telling the story of how these ex-communist officers worked with the CIA to create an alliance with the United States. And so he was more open to that. And that opened to me many possibilities to interview underlings who had worked with him or under him over the course of their careers. They then gave me information about the American CIA officers who'd worked with them that allowed me to contact them back in America. Now, there were many CIA officers and a significant portion didn't want to speak with the Washington Post whatsoever, understandable, but there were some who did. And so that gave me a, a lot of uh, information about, from the CIA's perspective, why did the Americans reach out to the Poles? From the Polish perspective, why were they open to the American outreach and how then that, that alliance uh, worked? And the backstory was fascinating. <clears throat> From the beginning of the Cold War, and specifically in the 70s, the CIA actually had a very high opinion of Polish spies. The CIA also, also secretly did work with Polish intelligence officers uh, in terms of buying weapons, et cetera, on a, on, on, uh, during the Iran-Contra issue in the 19, in 1970s as well. But, but the CIA was actually had a very, very significant respect for Polish tradecraft. Polish spies had been operating in the United States throughout the 60s and the 70s. And in the 70s, a senior Polish spy ultimately was involved with a, in a massive theft of American military secrets based in Los Angeles. And the CIA officer ultimately ended up <clears throat> being involved in the arrest of this Polish officer was a fellow by the name of John Palovich, uh, who what, what was very impressed with the tradecraft of that Polish spy, Marian Zaharski. And when Zaharsky was ultimately exchanged on the Bridge of Spies in 1984 um, for 26 some odd American agents who had been operating in East Germany, Palovich committed to himself, basically he had a thought to himself, ultimately I really would like to work with this guy and not against him because the tradecraft of these professionals is of such a quality that they could really be useful to the United States. And so 
when Poland's political change begins to happen in 89 and 90, with the election of a, of a, a solidarity government, Palovich has this idea that we need to actually, now we can begin to, outward, to, to reach out to our Polish um, uh, intelligence comrades, if you will, and begin to create a relationship with these guys. And at the time, the, the, the administration of George H.W. Bush was also looking at Poland's transition from a communist country into a liberal democracy, if you will, and wondering how this transition was gonna be done. And so the Bush administration and the CIA began to lobby the Polish government to say, look, don't dismantle all your communist bureaucracies. Don't dismantle your foreign intelligence bureaus. Don't dismantle your police, because if you begin a revolution at ground zero, you're going to probably have a counter-revolution on your hands because you haven't give the, given the communists a stake in the, uh, in the new Poland. And the CIA was also pushing this line for selfish purposes, because as Palovich had argued within the CIA, these guys, these spies are good. We can use them. And so in 1990, Palovich proposes to Paul Redman, who at the time was the deputy director of operations for Soviet and Eastern Europe of the CIA, hey, I want to go make an outreach to my Polish comrades. What do you think? And Redman says, great. And so there's a debate about where is the outreach going to be done, right? Is it going to be done in Rome, for example, uh, where a, a Polish officer by the name of Alexander Makovsky had done a year at Harvard Law School, courtesy of an American uh, uh, scholarship as a spy uh, studying American constitutional law, or should it be done elsewhere? The problem with Rome is that despite this old school ties between Redmond, who was a Harvard man, and Makovsky, the, the embassy in Rome was on an alley and Italian counterintelligence could monitor the comings and goings and the Americans didn't want to involve a, a third country in this operation. So they thought about Switzerland, but again, Swiss counterintelligence is famous. For its, for its professionalism, they finally settled on Lisbon, which the Portuguese were kind of, uh, their, their reputation was as a, as a relatively sleepy service. And so Palovich goes to Lisbon in March of 1990 on his traveling on his real passport over the course of his career, actually he had about seven or eight passports. He's traveling on his real passport. He knocks on the door of the Polish embassy on a major avenue in Lisbon gets in to see a consular official who is actually a Polish spy and announces that the CIA wants to begin a real relationship with the Polish government, uh, the Polish, uh, the Polish uh, intelligence services. His interlocutor, the Polish officer, kicks uh, Palovich out of his office, uh, denies that he's a spy, outraged, etc. cetera, um, and, and Palovich is left to find a taxi on his own. But then that night, the Polish officer, Richard Tomaszewski, sends a cable to Warsaw saying, the CIA just came knocking on my door, what do I do? And the Polish officers saying, this is something we've been waiting for. We knew this was gonna happen. And they tell him, call Palovich back up. And in May of 1990, a delegation of CIA officers comes to Lisbon and, the, and they're off to the races. So that was the backstory of this uh, operation. And then, and then in August of 1990, Saddam invades Kuwait, these six Americans, who, who, uh, one of whom is in possession of significant intelligence about exactly how the Americans would plan to remove Saddam from Kuwait, are stuck in Baghdad. The Americans go to the French, the Brits, the Russians. None of them can help. They finally go to the Poles. And because of Palovich's knowledge of the professionalism of the Polish services, he argues with the Americans that these guys could do the operation. Gromosław Czempinski is sent down to Iraq. He then collects these characters, gives them six fake Polish workers overalls, six fake Polish passports with fake Polish names. Sadly, the Americans couldn't pronounce their Polish names, but that's another story. He, at a certain point, he douses them with Johnny Walker Black, trying to camouflage them as drunk Eastern European workers, and he drives them out of, out of Iraq in this Argo-like operation. This creates a blood bond between the two services. It, it shows that the Americans, the Americans have a lot of respect for Polish. To, Polish tradecraft and the Poles realize they can use intelligence as a way to increase, to, to, to tighten their bonds with Washington and accomplish their goal of entering NATO. The services then begin to operate around the world. Poland at the time in this sort of internecine in, in, in period between communism and capitalism have bureaus, have embassies in places where Americans couldn't work. Pyongyang, Tehran, Havana, and other hotspots they had as UN political officers, they had close relations with Hezbollah 
in, in Lebanon. And so they begin to do operations around the world. And of course, this kind of culminates in Poland's NATO entry. And with the Poles saying, look, the reason we did these operations with the Americans is because we didn't want to be simply seen to be the recipient of American largesse and help. We wanted to prove the United States that we could be not just a loyal ally, but a useful ally. And so that was very important in their argument with America to open NATO's doors to Poland accession, in addition to the Czech Republic and other countries. Um, and the Americans accepted this and the Americans understood because of Poland's position in having all these diplomatic places around the world and also in Poland's excellent at human intelligence um, work, they could use the Poles as well. Now, the relationship is wonderful. 1994, Mike Sulik, who was a station chief in Warsaw, is talking with his Polish partners and he said, we have great relationship now, but like, because we are, and, 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 and the relationship is growing by, by leaps and bounds. But Sulik had this premonition and he told his Polish counterparts, look, at a certain point, even though the relationship is amazing now, you need to prepare for the day that the United States is gonna screw you. Now, we're not gonna screw you in the way that the Soviets did, we're gonna screw you in a particularly American way. We're gonna kind of think we're well-meaning, but at the end of the day, we will screw you. And that premonition turns out to have been true. After 9-11, the terrorist attacks on the United States, the administration of George W. Bush goes to, the, his, his, goes to the polls and said, look, we've captured these terrorist suspects and we need a place to house them so we can interrogate them. Can we do it in Poland? And the polls, because of their tradition of being wanting to be a loyal ally of the United States, basically say, yes, yeah, sure, you can do it. In, uh, in fact, you can do it within the confines of the Polish Intelligence Training Center. So the Americans then set up this villa there, which they use American paint to paint. They use an American 110 volted system. They don't want to be on the European system. And they basically set up this, from the, listening to how the polls have told the story, basically a little piece of the CIA in the middle of this Polish intelligence training ground, this two-story villa, where a series of terrorist suspects are brought uh, and subjected to enhanced interrogation techniques, otherwise known as torture. Waterboarding, walling, beating, mock executions, sleep deprivation, et cetera. And the Poles don't know really what, say they don't, they never knew actually what was happening inside this villa. And the Poles, begin to feel extremely uncomfortable about what's happening there because they get little indications that it might not all be according to uh, normal standards recognized by the European Union. In fact, at a certain point, the Poles go to the Americans and say, we need you to sign an MOU guaranteeing the certain level of treatment of these people. Will you do so? And the Americans, the CIA declines. So this goes on up until the point that Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, the, believed to be the architect of the 9-11, uh, disaster is, is, is caught in Pakistan and brought to Poland. And the Poles say he's the final one. And he's then waterboarded some odd 183 times while he's in Poland. Uh, he's ultimately taken out. And the Poles feel relieved that, look, look this, 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 this issue's gone. But then CIA officers leak about this issue. And while it's a wonderful thing that it, it appeared in the, in the Western press so we could learn what the CIA was doing, for Poland, it was an extraordinarily difficult moment. They were kind of, they felt left holding the bag, kind of abandoned by the CIA and punished for the fact that they were more zipped up than the CIA had been. Nonetheless, even after this imbroglio and the fact that the Poles lost significant trust in the agency, the Poles continued to work for the CIA, both in Iran and in North Korea, being involved in very sensitive operations for the United States. And so in discussing this issue with a senior Poland, Polish politician, a former foreign minister by the name of Radoslav Sikorsky, he kind of talked this, about the simile in terms of how it feels to be a small country in a relationship with the United States and desperate to be America's allies. He said, look, an alliance with the United States is like marrying a hippopotamus. At first, it's very warm and cuddly. Then the hippo turns, crushes you, and doesn't even notice. Um, so with that, um, I just want to thank you for letting me uh, speak here today. And I look forward to Tom, uh, Ambassador Simon's um, commentary and your questions. So thank you very much. Very good. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much, John. Um, let me turn to Tom. Uh, I think you're muted, Tom.
Well, uh, Mark, thank you for having me here. John, it's good to see you again. Uh, that was a, an eloquent synopsis and it's a wonderful read. Uh, you write with the kind of subdued passion, if I could put it that way, that uh, you, you showed us just now. Uh, it's a great story and it goes on for decades. I mean, it's, it's wonderfully researched. Uh, you know most of the people you've interviewed and talked to over decades, most of the people involved. And so it's a great story, but it's also a sad story. And I think you, uh, you bring that out. Uh, it, uh, it started off as a happy story. I mean, the, the exfiltration from, uh, from Baghdad was a, a, a great moment uh, after the end of the Cold War. I can remember uh, I was ambassador from September 1990 to April of 1993. So uh, when the exfiltration uh, took place, uh, and I remember walking into the station chief's house and it was full of these people in white shirts and khaki pants. And I, I remember yelling, who are these people? And, uh, and so it was, a, it was a happy moment. It was also... Uh, the process that John describes uh, of uh, coming together the intelligence services, it also fit like a Matryoshka doll uh, within the larger uh, policy framework. I mean, Poland at that point had no security cover uh, at all uh, after the, uh, the abolition of the Warsaw Pact. Uh, Poland was alone in the world with 30,000 uh, Soviet troops uh, uh, still on its soil. It was negotiating for uh, their departure, but uh, uh, Poland had uh, every interest in a good relationship uh, with the United States and this intelligence part of it uh, really was a spearhead. Uh, uh, in the aftermath of the exfiltration, uh, we had visits uh, from uh, the head of the CIA, Judge Webster, and the head of the FBI, uh, uh, Bill Sessions. And I can remember uh, the, uh, the polls gave the, the uh, dinner, the welcoming dinner to Judge Webster in a villa, which was quite near my residence and, and which was notorious as a, as a UB or a Polish intelligence uh, villa. Uh, they'd had a, in 19, 1964, the head of it died mysteriously in that villa. My wife and I walked past it every day. And so we had their dinner for Judge Webster there. The next night, uh, my wife and I gave the dinner uh, down the street in our residence. And Gromek Chempinski, uh, I said to him, you know, Gromek, it was really a treat to be in that villa last night. And he said, well, if that was a treat for you, Imagine what it's a treat, what kind of a treat it is for me, because I know every nook and cranny of this resident of my residence, but I've never been inside it. So, so that was the, that was the, <laughs> these were the people who'd run against us for years and, and who were now uh, becoming uh, partners uh, and cooperators. Nevertheless, it is a sad story because it, it sours uh, at the end. Um, not, it's not the only place in the world that that has happened. Uh, uh, you should, uh, we can talk to Afghans now and get a taste of, the, of their recent, ex recent experience with us. But uh, it's particularly sad uh, because as John points out in his book, Americans and Poles really do click together. I mean, they're, they're comfortable uh, with each other, uh, a century and a half of, of uh, relationships uh, in ways that uh, Americans don't necessarily have with other uh, uh, Central and, and East Europeans. And yet in the end, uh, as Mike Sulik uh, predicted and told them, uh, we ended up dropping them. Uh, I served in Pakistan and the Pakistanis used to say that we, uh, after the Soviets withdrew from Afghanistan, we dropped them like a used Kleenex. So 
Uh, and I think there's a bitterness that the Poles have. And Radek Sikorsky, I think, uh, with his uh, uh, metaphor of the hippo. Uh, so my question to you, John, is could it have been avoided? Since this relationship did fit like a Matryoshka doll within our overall relationship, and our interest as a country uh, simply shifted, uh, uh, it, it continued until uh, the East Central Europeans joined NATO and then the, the EU. Uh, but the, the specific flavor of the relationship uh, deteriorated because uh, American interest shifted elsewhere. Could it have been avoided, do you think? Thanks, Tom. It's great to see you and hear you. Um, so I think a certain amount of that was just inevitable because in this kind of gray zone between communism and liberal democracy, in quotes, you had this period where Poland wasn't quite associated with the United States. It hadn't joined NATO. Uh, it wasn't considered a staunch ally of America. And in that space, Polish operatives could operate almost as if they were independent, even though they were working for the CIA. And so I think that as that period of time ended and as Poland entered NATO and as Poland began to be viewed around the world by our America's adversaries as a staunch ally of America, you're naturally going to get less, uh, Poland's less ability to maneuver in that gray zone. The gray zone actually would end and, and it became sort of a zone where they're associated. So I think that a certain amount was natural. I mean, the relationship was so, the, the intelligence risk was so good that in 2000, uh, then director, CIA director George Tenet writes a letter to Bogdan Libera, who was the head of Polish intelligence, basically saying, our intelligence cooperation with you is the second best America's had in its history. And obviously, the, the first best would be the UK, but still an extraordinary thing for Tenet, who was known for his bombast even, to claim, considering our close relationship with the Australians, not to mention a very close relationship with Israel's Mossad. But nonetheless, so it's an, it, 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 it's, it's an example of how close it had become. And I think inevitably that ardor was going to fade with time as Poland began to be associated in the minds of America's allies with America's, uh, with, as an American um, alliance ally. That said, the way the CIA handled it and the black sites issue um, and the sort of the turn away we've had from Poland was unnecessary, I think. And that added fuel to this, to this fire uh, and really increased a lot of Poland's doubts about, um, about the alliance. That said, they have no place to go. So Poland is now confronting this issue on its border with Belarus. And of course, Poland reaches out to the EU, which is an important, a hugely important partner for Poland, but also directly to the United States as well, basically hoping to rely on American support as, as this, this crisis with Belarus hopefully doesn't spiral out of control. Um, so that said, while they feel burned in many ways, they also have no place else to go because they can't go back to Moscow and they understand that being independent of the United States is a non-starter as well. Well, they do have Europe. They do. I right. mean, they, it's an alternative to either Moscow or the United States. And uh, watching them, uh, I haven't de dealt directly with Poland for many years, but trying to keep up with the events. It seems to me that uh, uh, in the first decade of the millennium, I don't know the odd odds, uh, after 9-11, that the Poles uh, uh, under President Kwasniewski uh, really did try to uh, develop a, uh, a special relationship, sort of a mini version uh, of the uh, traditional relationship with the British, uh, which frays and comes back together and uh, persists in sort of ragtag form uh, over the years. And, and I, it seemed to me that the Poles were being overambitious. I mean, not just because Sulik ha had warned them, but because uh, as Radek Sikorsky said, they are enthusiastic about their alliances. You quote uh, that in the book, and maybe a little too enthusiastic. I mean, to the point of, of uh, irreal, uh, the sort of unreal expectations of, of a, uh, a stable uh, uh, geopolitical uh, alliance with the United States, which would 
uh, protect them, not just against the Russians, but maybe also against the Europeans. I mean, they seem to be wading through that quagmire uh, now, he, even as they uh, uh, want to be the shield of Europe against the East uh, in the Belarusian crisis. Does that seem plausible to you? Yeah, it does. I, I think you're absolutely right that Kwasniewski, partially because Kwasniewski, interestingly, was an ex-communist. He's actually the first ex-communist president to be directly elected uh, since the 1989 changes in the fall of the Berlin Wall. And as an ex-communist, he, he said, he said, he told me this, he felt under even more pressure to show that he was pro-American than somebody would have if they had come from a solidarity background where their pro-Americanist was basically simply assumed. And I think the Americans used that as a lever to get him to do things that perhaps a solidarity leader, if he'd been president of Poland, might have been somewhat reluctant to do, such as opening the black sites where torture could, could be carried out on Polish soil. Of course, the same. After, so, sorry, let me, but after he left power and the administration of Donald Tusk take, t takes, takes, takes control, um, he was a prime minister, Poland does begin to pivot and begin to focus more energy and effort on its relationship with Europe than they do on the United States because they were burned. That said, on the intelligence area, the Poles can, can, can continue to go full speed ahead in, 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 in helping and trying to be a good partner with the United States. Of course, so they kind of well, begin to run on two tracks, if you will. Yeah. Well, and uh, let me just say, Tom, the, the pro-US sentiment was also went well beyond just intelligence and political circles in Poland. You know, there was a real um, strong pro-American sentiment among the Polish population. And that too, I think was bound over time to dissipate, particularly with small slights like the failure to approve Poland for the visa waiver, waiver program, you know, which could have been done if uh, someone at the State Department had really pushed it, but, um, but it never was until recently, a few years ago. Um, and so, uh, you know, there, there were, small things the United States could have done that would have, I think, maintained that aura that it enjoyed that simply weren't done. And th that's why I like um, Shikorsky's uh, metaphor of the uh, hippopotamus and everything. Um, so please, Tom. Yeah, well, and I should say that the visa waiver, uh, uh, part of the uh, uh, merit uh, uh, for finally getting that was a successor of mine, Victor Ash who comes out of Republican politics and managed to get it into the Republican platform uh, at, a, at a certain point. And, and that carried it when the Republicans uh, came back to power. But uh, John, you have, uh, I, I think your Polish sources may be better in some ways than your American sources. I mean, you have a really sort of a complete panoply of interviews on that side and maybe a little more reticence on the other side. But, how do you, why was it that the Americans in, in the years 2000 after 9-11, the, the black site would be one example. I think there were probably others were, were, were so just debonair, I should put nonchalant about the way they treated the Poles. I mean, the, it, it, it sounded the, the request even to have a black site in Poland uh, seems to me unwise. Uh, you know, it was something that was not going to last. It was going to damage an important relationship because uh, it would surely come out. I mean, what were people thinking in Washington uh, after 9-11 uh, about the, because the Poles were also have the, had the southern sector of Iraq. Right. And they were also in Afghanistan. I mean, they were doing lots of things with us uh, right. beyond the intelligence relationship. So to hear the ex-agency guys tell the story, and these were people who um, in some cases were no longer serving at the time or were just ending their careers because they have a sense that their predecessors in the uh, sort of, sort of the, their successors in the CIA didn't understand the history of the two countries and how that intelligence bond had been formed. 
And they didn't understand a lot of the history of the solidarity movement. They didn't understand a lot of Poland's natural uncomfortableness with torture going on in Polish soil because of the, the Poland's experience with the SB and, and, and Soviet domination and communist domination as well. The Nazi. And, and, and the Nazis is, it, 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 yeah, exactly. Not, not even to mention the Nazis. And so that uh, failure to kind of come to grips with Polish history or even recognize that it had a, a very special history set the foundation for some of the mistakes that were made. Uh, and I think that that played an important role. I mean, the assumption was that Poland was, as, as the director of uh, climate and operations for the CIA put it, America's 51st state. But that was just an assumption, but there's no understanding of why. And I think that that set the scene for, for, for real disappointment on both sides. I remember a 4th of July party that we held and two little round uh, politicians from the east of Poland. One of them uh, uh, told me to bend, bend down to his ear or to his mouth and, I, and he whispered, uh, you know, we can't say it, but we would like to be the 51st state. Right. And I, I sent him down, I sent them, those two, they were like, like um, uh, duck pins uh, down the line. But uh, how do you think, the, well, I mean, we're, we're both following it now from afar. I think you have more recent contacts than I do. Uh, would you talk a little bit more about the, the uh, sort of the witch hunt against these people, people who had, uh, that has uh, been going on since, first since 2005 and then since 2015. I, th I think you mentioned the uh, going after the pensions, which is uh, churlish and uh, sort of awful. But if you could talk a little bit more about that and, and then, uh, then ask why the current government is picking fights uh, uh, not just by going after the people that we worked with all those years, but picking fights on uh, on, on larger uh, w issues with the United States at a time when it's also fighting uh, the EU. Yes, I will do that. I, I let, just let me kind of... quickly, John, broaden that a little to say um, what what was the reaction of U.S. officials to the to the perennial embroilment of the intelligence services in US politics. So did they see that as leaving Polish intelligence vulnerable to these the sorts of reprisals that Tom just mentioned? Yeah, I, I mean, they, they were, and talking with Sikorsky, but also other Polish officials, they were really in, uncomfortable with the politicization of intelligence in this country. Um, and they basically said, this is something that should have, that we should have had as a problem, not you. And the fact that you have it as a problem makes us really, um, you know, uh, makes our, our view of the relationship going forward very problematic. Um, and so, Tom, to your question, I, I think that, um, sorry, I sort of refresh my memory. I just had a little crisis here with my video. So could you just repeat the question? Well, the, the question is, uh, I mean, I asked you to to expand a little on the the witch hunt that's been oh, right. yeah. Thank you. going on two thousand five and then two thousand fifteen, and but the, the question is the larger question of why the peace government, the law and justice government. Uh, yeah, peace. Let me just explain quickly, Tom. Peace is the Polish acronym for uh, law and justice, the right. ruling party in two thousand five to two thousand seven, and again since 2015 to this day. So but it's not only going, going after the people that we worked with uh, who are now in their 60s and 70s, as you point out. I mean, they're harmless by any definition. Um, but also it's picking fights with the United States uh, at the same time where it's in kind of an existential tension with the EU. And it ends up, as Sikorsky says, uh, with no friends at all. Yeah. So I think that uh, the, the peace government uh, law and justice party in, in the early 2000s and then um, from 2015 on was led by people who were somewhat involved in the solidarity trade union push, but all sort of on the sidelines. But they always believed in this 
this, this sort of maximalist view of how Poland should deal with the communists, which is basically punishing them all, removing them from society and starting Poland at this mythical year zero with no communists, all of them kind of punished forever for having collaborated with the communists and then marching forward with a clean Poland. And so when they took power in 2015, they passed a, a law basically cutting the pensions of many of the foreign intelligence officers who had served under, to basically below poverty level. So Richard Tomaszewski, the, the gentleman who, who met Palovich in, in Lisbon, is now living on 150 bucks a month. He's had to move out of his uh, apartment in, in, in Gdansk with his wife, and they've moved into a dormitory because they have no money on which to live. And there's hundreds of, in fact, thousands of people like that, former police detective, homicide detectives, maids who actually clean the floors in the SB, the internal, the Ministry of Internal Affairs. And these people are being punished by the current regime because the current regime has this belief that we need to expunge every last communist sort of cell from the body politic of, of, of the Polish nation. Um, it's a maximalist position. And it's a position that didn't win out in 1989 and 1990, thanks to the kind of forward thinking views of the Polish solidarity government at the time, but also bolstered, like I said, by the United the administration of George H.W. Bush and people like Ambassador Simons and the CIA as well. Um, and why are they doing this? I mean, there seems to be this sort of proto-religious sense um, of their mission in Poland. Uh, and at the same time they're doing this, they're also alienating to, to, in many ways, the EU as well, which is a huge donor to Poland of billions of dollars of, of, of economic aid uh, and to the very people who support the Law and Justice Party. So that's creating sort of a bit of a contradiction in terms of how the Law and Justice Party is going to push forward in, into the future. That said, because the Polish economy is relatively healthy, uh, law and justice doesn't really lose, they don't really lose many elections, and they've also succeeded in dominating the Polish media as well. Um, and so that makes it very difficult for a different voice to come up in Polish politics and to, to, to oppose them. Now, in big cities like Warsaw and Gdansk, et cetera, the sort of somewhat liberal view is, is stronger. But in the rest of Poland, uh, law and justice remains very influential and very prominent and very powerful. Yeah, and, it, and uh, generally, uh, it seems the first peace government, what, you know, 2005 to 2007, was less radical than the current one. And that may have something to do with Lech Kaczynski, who, uh, who was uh, president back in the, uh, at the same time that the first government was there, headed by his twin brother, Yaroslav. Um, he was he died in an airplane crash in April 2010 and um, his brother his twin brother believes I think wrongly that it was a Russian plot um, abetted by certain people within Poland and so as a result when this new peace government took power in 2015 Yaroslav Kaczynski was of a much more um, vengeful nature, I think, than he had been during the first government. And that undoubtedly accounts partly for why some of these reprises are being exacted. Yeah, I think that's, that's absolutely right. Yeah. I agree with that, but I think there, there may be two other, two other elements to it. First, uh, peace was in coalition in 2005, and so it made it harder to, uh, to be radical for those who wanted to be radical. I think the, the death of the brother is one element. Another one is simply growing older because you get a, a mentality of this is our last chance to make things right. And in Polish politics, I've, I've always felt, I've served there in the 60s and 70s uh, also, <laughs> the disease of Polish politics is moralism. I mean, people, people don't think politically that the, the first solidarity government and the solidarity movement itself was an exception in Polish history then it, it did think politically, mm -hmm. partly because it spent a lot of time in the slammer uh, after martial law in 1981. Uh, but the, the default position in Polish politics is extreme moralism, uh, you know, where you're looking for uh, all or nothing, you're looking for black and white, you're looking for, for purity. Um, uh, I have to say, however, that looking back on my time in the early 90s when Poland was going through these transition, this transition, 
we thought the movement toward democracy and the free market and good neighborly relations was the movement of history. We thought it was probably gonna last forever. So I think we, we also had our own version uh, of idealism at the time. And that's one of the reasons I think we're so disappointed. And, and your book, I think will embed that kind of disappointment in the way people think about Poland. I hope people read it because I think you need to grapple with our version of uh, this is gonna last forever. Uh, as well. Um, if I could, uh, John, let me just turn to a couple of questions from the audience. Um, and uh, you feel free to chime in too, Tom. Is, um, first is, uh, why do you think it was the, the Polish intelligence service and its agents did such a good job? That is, how did they manage to impress the CIA? And what was it specifically that they, they, where did their ta real talents lie? So Poles have always been really good spies. Um, and as one senior State Department official told me, he said, if, if you're a country like Poland and you don't have a good intelligence agency, you're probably going to cease to exist. I mean, Poland is flat and it's an invasion route. It's always been an invasion route for cavalry and for tanks. And I think that the Poles realized that they needed specifically starting in the 1920s, but even before that, but starting in the 1920s, they focused significant resources to creating good, a good intelligence service. And in the 1920s, the Soviet Union invaded Poland as part of Lenin's idea to export his revolution to the rest of a, a, a welcoming Europe. And the Polish army beat back the Soviet Red Army thanks to a, the breaking of the Soviet codes by Polish intelligence officers. In the 1930s, the Poles were involved in cracking the Enigma code. They actually created one of the first two prototypes of the Enigma machine, the Nazi codes, which they gave to the British that, that ultimately helped the British crack the codes. And so this is a tradition that, that goes back well before communism. And then, of course, in the communist era, the Poles were considered by the CIA to be a significant opponent. They, their focus was on industrial espionage. But they, off, they also got involved, thanks to Marian Zaharsky, with significant military uh, espionage as well. And so we knew they were good at this because they had to be. A country like Poland, as the, uh, the State Department guy said, would cease to exist without good spies. Their particular, their focus on, actually they had two focuses. One, because their math is very strong, they were very good at signals intelligence. Yeah. So, and so the NSA actually has a very close relationship with Poland on that front. But on the uh, civilian side, their human intelligence, their whole uh, case officer uh, their, um, kind of uh, philosophy is very good. They're, they're very good at cultivating sources. And around the world, Poland, and, and you can clearly see how they, that America looked at, Americans never looked at Poles as spies. We looked at so, as enemies. We looked at Soviets, the Soviets as enemies. We clearly looked at the Bulgarians as enemies, but the Poles could pass through American society. In fact, they could pass through many societies kind of unnoticed. And <laughs> that ability really helped them uh, in, in terms of uh, human intelligence and human collection, uh, information collection. So that's kind of a sort of a potted history of the Polish spy services and why the CIA used them so, so in so many places around the world. Okay, uh, next question, let me say, has, um, has the disillusion that set in caused Polish officials to reconsider their relationship with NATO, not to leave NATO, but to seek a different kind of alignment with it? Well, there, during the Trump administration, there was this flirtation between Trump and the Poles, and Trump liked to cultivate the relationship with Poland as a lever in a way to use against Europe, right? When he withdrew military for American military from Germany, he actually wanted to send them to Poland as a way to sort of insult Angela Merkel. Uh, he floated the idea of a, just a bilateral relationship between Poland and America, an idea that was encouraged by the, by the Polish government, the law and justice government at the time. The Poles even floated the idea of turning, uh, naming an American and military establishment in Poland, Fort Trump. Fort Trump um, yeah. and, and so <laughs> this type of, and, and so there was that flirtation. At the same time, though, um, the professionals involved in the military relationship, both on the U.S. side 
and the Poland side, I'm talking within the Polish military, have concluded that the only way to actually have a, a strong relationship with the United States is to embed that relationship in NATO. Clearly, that's what the Biden administration thinks. And so if we don't have a revanche revolution in this country, um, my sense is that we're going to kind of stay in NATO. Um, that said, you know, the ardor for the, the, the passionate relationship with America has cooled. The challenge for law and justice, though, as Tom, as Ambassador Simons has pointed out, is the polls can't alienate everybody. And that's what they seem to be in the process of doing. Hopefully, if there's a silver the lining, uh, there's a silver the lining. Uh, excuse me? Except, except, except Orban. Orban in Hungary. Yeah, yeah, hopefully if there's a silver lining to this crisis um, in, in Belarus, it will bring Poland back into a more rational view of where its security interests really lie. They can't alienate everybody because then they will be alone. In that sense, uh, the, you know, it's quite different from Hungary where Urban has sought a very, you know, kind of alarmingly close relationship with Putin. Um, very strange wow. policy for someone who was once a fiery anti-communist. Um, but, uh, in, in any case, okay, let me turn to uh, um, uh, Mark. Mark, yes, please, I, Tom, please. Yeah, there, there's also an idea floating around. I don't probably won't go anywhere in Poland of, of being the spark plug of a coalition of small countries between the Baltic and the Black Sea. And as Radek Sikorsky points out, that was tried once before in 1939. But, yeah. uh, that was, uh, that, that was Colonel, Colonel Beck's approach to things and look where it got them. Anyway, Mark. Yeah, and, and Leonid Kravchuk had proposed that same thing in the early 1990s and it went nowhere. Um, so I'm not sure that, uh, you know, that I mean, I think it's kind of a figment of someone's imagination now. But um, uh, so next question would be, um, any evidence for the suspicion of assassination? I assume that this is referring to Lech Kaczynski. Um, please, if uh, I, I'll be glad to address it, but um, there, there isn't, there, the um, overwhelming evidence is that it was a plane crash brought on through pilot error, um, unconnected with the Russian government. The current, government in Poland, especially Yaroslav Kaczynski, will never believe that, however, and will insist that it was a Russian plot and that um, there were people inside Poland who were complicit in it, possibly including Donald Tusk. Um, so uh, it's, it's really a, um, a situation in which you one side believes what it believes and no amount of evidence will ever change that particular version of what they think happened. And any please comment though, either of you. <laughs> no, I completely agree. It's sort of the Polish version of stop the steal. I mean, it's very yeah. similar mindset. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, and I think there is also a difference in Hungary because in with Hungary, because uh, Poland has a real opposition. I mean, Tusk is back in Warsaw mm -hmm. as, as someone who can, uh, um, bring together some kind of effective opposition. I think uh, Orban has really uh, almost gotten rid of his opposition uh, in Hungary. So I think Poland has a, a, a more hopeful political system and political situation. I mean, the peace government is now a minority government. Uh, and uh, I don't know when the next election is, but uh, I think there's a chance that just as 2005 led to 2007, uh, the 2015 can lead to a different result. Um, let me ask if I could, John, if you could comment a bit. You have some very interesting um, explanations of the pardon of Richard Kuglinski. Um, and uh, if you could say a bit more about that for our, let me just fill in quickly the background. Richard Kuglinski was an invaluable spy for the CIA on the Polish general staff in the uh, 1970s and was eventually exfiltrated in November 1981 when it uh, the Polish counterintelligence had discovered that in fact there was a spy within the um, 
you know, at very high levels. And so he, from that point on, lived in the United States. But um, in the 1990s, he was in uh, mid 1990s, he was able to return to Poland for the first time. But he was still officially not yet fully, um, fully absolved of the supposed crime of treason to the country and espionage. So if you could comment on that, because you fill in, I think, um, very in a very interesting way, some of the way the eventual full pardon was granted. Well, from the it was very interesting because in within the CIA it had enormous amount of loyalty to Kuklinski for the risks he took to provide the United States with just firsthand, absolutely extraordinarily intelligence, not simply about what was happening inside Warsaw, but what was happening inside the Warsaw Pact General Command. So Kuklinski is generally recognized as one of the great, if not the greatest asset that the United States ever had in all of the kind of former under, under you know, Soviet control. And so as the Poland begins to uh, move towards pushing for NATO extension, there's significant lobbying done within the CIA for the, for the United States government to really make the exoneration of Kuklinski in Poland almost a part of Poland's NATO trans transition. Now it happens after the Poles formally enter NATO, but, at the, at, at, but, but, but while Poland was, was applying for NATO, if you will, those years, the CIA and the US administrations, in this case, the Clinton administration, were basically arguing with the Poles that you have to exonerate this guy. Um, and it's important for you to recognize his service. Now, there was significant pushback in Poland against this, specifically among old military officers who'd served as, as communist officers. And the most prominent of them would be Wojciech Jaruzelski, who was kind of the sunglassed um, poster boy of, of you know, late Soviet era communism in the 1980s. And he was very against this. And his argument was, if this guy is a hero, what does that make us? And Jaruzelski liked to portray his activities in Poland in the 1980s with instituting martial law in 1981 as a way to, as basically a patriotic activity that stopped the Soviet Union from invading Poland like the Soviets had in, in, in Prague in 1968 or Hungary in 1956. And so this whole debate was, was fascinating because the CIA really gets involved in pushing for conclusive and exoneration and for pushing Poland to kind of define in a different way what it meant to be a patriotic Pole. Was it Jaruzelski who said, I defended Poland against the Soviets. Yeah, I had to institute martial law, but that protected Poland against the broader threat of Russian intervention. Or was it Kuklinski who was working from the Americans secretly from the 1970s on? And this whole debate was fascinating because the CIA was deeply involved in what it really meant to be a Pole, which when you flash forward to today, the CIA is not involved in anything. It just wants to do joint operations with the Poles and it doesn't really care who's up or who's down, who's in power or who's not. And I think that that kind of movement of the CIA and the United States government to disengage in a way from Poland is a good thing if you think of we shouldn't be involving ourselves in the internal affairs of other countries. But it's also somewhat interesting because in that we no longer seem to care, back to Ambassador Simon's points, how the Polish government comports itself in terms of you know, prosecuting the people who created an alliance with America in the first place, or lots of violations of judicial precedent in its courts, et cetera, um, going forward. And I think Kuklinski's case was, was a fascinating one, showing how deep, really deep our engagement in the whole Polish debate about what it meant to be a Pole was at the time. I, I would just add that Zbigniew Brzezinski was, was also um, heavily involved in that. And he was a Democrat, although some people <laughs> doubt that. But, uh, and it was the Clinton administration. So he was quite a champion yes. uh, of the uh, Kuklinski uh, uh, exoneration effort. I know Mark has very strong views about Jaruzelski as a hero. So maybe he should say something about it. Well, I mean, I, 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 I think the fullest ex, uh, explication of my views on that, it was in Jesus Belief of the Polish Daily Newspaper about 10 years ago. Um, and uh, it was in response to 
an article or interview, I think, that um, in which Yarazelski lashed into me um, it, it, because I had uh, criticized the notion that he was a hero and had acted heroically. On, on the other hand, I don't see him, uh, he's a, he was a complicated figure in that it is true he was under excruciating Soviet pressure during the crisis and he could never be sure that the Soviet Union wouldn't evade. In fact, they tried to make him, deliberately tried to make him think they would invade. Um, I'm not even convinced that they wouldn't have if somehow martial law had <laughs> failed and if civil war had broken out in Poland in, in December 1981. So, um, but regardless though, he, he, unlike his predecessor Stanislav Kanya, um, who, who had been the head of the Polish Communist Party until uh, October 1981, um, that Jaruzelski was brought in because it was known that he would impose martial law, and in fact he did. Um, so he basically uh, suppressed his, his, the democratic movement in his country on behalf of the Soviet Union. So for him, ultimately, loyalties to the Soviet Union took pri priority over his loyalty to Poland. He was loyal to Poland, there's no question, but uh, priority for him was loyalty to the Soviet Union. <laughs> that, that may be unkind, but I, you know, his self-serving rationalizations of his actions really irritated me at times because he had a case to make. It's just that he really <laughs> exaggerated. I have a more benign view and more importantly, so did my president. George H. W. Bush was actually uh, sure. quite fond of Jaruzelski and felt that he'd played a constructive role in convincing Jaruzelski to stay on uh, in 1989 and uh, in order to uh, uh, put a sort of an umbrella uh, over the transition to a, a, a solidarity government, uh, given the fact that uh, as Macharevich and, and Naimsky and all those fine folk uh, uh, remember the, the, the power ministries were still full of communists. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. And so there John was a, there was that. a rationale for it. Yeah. yeah, John discussed, as you rightly point out, Tom, um, and John does cover that in his book. So for people who read the book, I hope people will go out and buy the book, um, but the, uh, to understand that this was a transitional period for Poland and blacks and whites, you know, sort of the, um, the, the opposites were not always easy to discern. There was a lot of gray during that transition. And it's not, um, you know, it's, it's a lot of ambiguity in that intelligence relationship was bound to arise because the CIA was dealing with many people who had been loyal to communism and who had, uh, been loyal to the Soviet Union. And there's yeah, also, so it was also a tr transitional period for us. <laughs> you know, the Poles weren't the only ones in transition. I mean, we had a, we had a wide open new world also. And yeah, and, 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 and asking for the CIA, there were some moments that were um, bizarre to say the least. For example, John Palovich was the American CIA officer of Polish extraction from Eastern Pennsylvania anthracite mine country. He had a situation where he was known in the agency as Mr. Poland. And actually, over the course of his career, he, as a case officer, he managed 18 Polish agents, Polish assets in, the, in Poland, which is extraordinary, considering some case officers in the CIA or have quite successful careers managing just one. So Palovitz had 18. And so he knew a lot of people in the Polish um, government, but, but also in the intelligence services as his assets. And he, found, he finds himself as Poland transitions into this new kind of democratic system, sitting across the table from senior Polish officials whom he who used to work for him as spies, now liaising with him as representatives of the Polish government. And he knew intimate details of these people's lives. He was involved in helping the, their kids get education, et cetera, but he couldn't show it because these guys who had been spies for America were suddenly now representing the Republic of Poland. And so that kind of curious ha thing was happening on a routine basis where Palovich was going, my God, the world is changing too fast. You know, I can't reveal that I know these people because that would out them as having been spies for the United States. 
uh, there's another question which um, do, does Poland have strong intelligence ties to other countries, for example, Germany, UK, et cetera, along with the United States? Yes, uh, they conducted in the 1990s operations with MI6 uh, because Poland had traditionally during communist times been in a place that exported weapons to terrorist organizations such as the IRA. In this case, um, MI6 and the Poles worked together to export weapons to the Ulster Volunteer Force, which was a Protestant um, radical group in Northern Ireland, that the weapons that were then um, uh, captured by the Brits and uh, some uh, Ulster Volunteer Force officials were rolled up. The Poles had very close relations with the Israelis because the Poles in um, 1990, 1991 had an operation to move Soviet Jews from the Soviet Union to Israel, and that needed a lot of security. Uh, and the Poles have had have have grown their relationship with the Germans as well, um, and, and, but particularly once Germany was brought into NATO, the Poles wanted to see that happen first, and then they opened really good relationship with the BND, the the German forces uh, as well. Um, let me ask someone. Uh has commented, did, did Poland at times feel, or did Poles feel insulted that they were, uh, had to um, adopt a subservient posture within NATO? That is that they um, were too deferential to the large countries like the United States. So they were never shy about expressing their opinion. And Victor Ash, um, the, the, the ambassador, uh, one of, of Tom's successors, um, pointed out in a WikiLeaks cable, he said the Poles are never shy about expressing their opinions. They're ex actually really quite boisterous about standing up for themselves. And I think uh, Tom can probably attest to that as well. Um, and it's interesting, um, we've talked a little bit about Poland's involvement in the invasion of Iraq. And the Poles were given actually a sector of Iraq to manage. Uh, uh, and when the polls went um, to the United States to discuss what the post-Iraq government would look like, they were um, gobsmacked at the American plan to debathifize all of Iraq. And the argument made by Jerzy Kosminski, who was the long-term Polish ambassador to the United States, was, what are you doing in Iraq? You are on the side in, in our country of arguing to maintain the communist structures as a transition to a new Poland, not to fire all the communists, to give them a stake in the, 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 the modern Poland. How could you be doing the exact same thing, the exact opposite of what you did in my country so successfully, what you advocated in our country so successfully in, in Iraq? You're going to have a civil war on your hands. And lo and behold, they did. Um, I, 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 I mean, the polls, we had relationships of frankness. I mean, where the Poles really, you know, they were never subservient. I think they were a little more tentative uh, in my time, which was the very early time uh, about where things were going and how to deal with us uh, than they became uh, in Victor Ashe's time. I mean, I, so I, I think they were a little, little more careful about uh, uh, cheesing us off. Uh, but they were clear about what uh, what they wanted and and uh, what they needed. I so I they may have felt a bash, Mark. But don't forget that they I, were. That wasn't out. my term, Tom. That was the questioner's term. So I was just no, using but, it. No, term. no. But they were coming out of forty years of subservience. So uh, you know, and they had to they had to learn to be cheeky again. Uh, and of course, they're. Uh, they're specializing in it now. Um, when you were when you were posted in Poland in earlier decades, Tom, did you find um, and you met ordinary Poles? Say, did you find a kind of pro-U.S. sentiment when they uh, found out that you were a U.S. official? Oh, ab absolutely. I mean, at a popular level, you know, America is is friends of Poland and, uh, and had been, and that's kept up by family ties because of the, the, our, there are 9 million Americans, I think in the 80 census who identified themselves as 
of Polish extraction. I mean, that has never translated into political power, block political power in American politics, but it does translate into a consciousness of a relationship with America and Americans uh, that's uh, positive throughout. So it, everybody was friendly. Uh, I mean, you did hear about Yalta, but, uh, but the, the basic uh, the affection uh, for America and Americans was, was, I think, probably constant throughout. The, the, the differences were the freedom to express it or not. And when I was ambassador there, the, there was full freedom to express it. In fact, I had to go around the country. Uh, uh, there's a, a Polish proverb about the rich uncle from America. The, the uh, Pole who goes to America and works in a mine or a meatpacking plant and comes back and lives like a little king in his village uh, on his social security checks. We, we traveled around the country handing out these social security checks, but I, because Valwansa was still pressing for a Marshall plan when I was there, when he was president and used to, uh, uh, for my first meeting with him, he reamed me out on, uh, on open television about doing more for Poland after what they'd done for uh, the world. And I just sat there and took it and waited until the cameras left and said, you know, you really shouldn't talk to an American ambassador like that. And, and he never did again, uh, but he was still clear that he thought we should do more. Uh, so I, I would go around saying there is no rich uncle from America. You know, your, your reform program is yours. You own it. Uh, you're going to suffer under it and you're going to benefit from it. And we're going to be alongside, but it's not our program. You're not doing it for us. And it, later on, it was very different in Russia because the Russians really did feel that uh, they were doing stuff for us and uh, that they owed us for that. The Poles always owned their own program. And uh, I think that's one of the reasons they have, they, they're the only country during the uh, 2007 and eight uh, economic crisis that continue to have a growth rate in Europe. I mean, they've had good policy and it's been there. Um, I, one thing I definitely want to have you do, uh, John, this will bring in your father is the choice of the title for the book. But before I do that, if you could, um, Tom just brought up about left minds. So if you could comment about the stance he took in um, in the mid 1990s after he had lost, after Alexander Kwasniewski had been elected president. And um, there seemed to be a, a period there where Valencia was trying to stage something like what Donald Trump did to place. Yeah, so Valencia, didn't take, uh, when the election campaign happens in, in the mid nineties and Valencia is being challenged by this young mediagenic uh, ex-communist named Alexander Kwasniewski, he doesn't really take him seriously in the beginning. And Kwasniewski kind of packaged himself not as an ex-communist, but as a, a member of New Poland, the sort of the outward looking westernizing New Poland. And in their one, uh, debate, I think there was only one debate, um, Kwasniewski just shellacks Valencia. Valencia mumbles, he gets caught on his words, and Kwasniewski is like, basically, I'm modern Poland, and you are a great revolutionary, and we thank you for your service, but go back to Gdansk, if you will. And so Kwasniewski beats him, uh, and, and after a runoff, he beats him in the election, and he wins the presidency, and he's yet to be um, sworn into office. And Valencia kind of has a desire to sort of throw a spanner in the works. And he reaches out to his Solidarity era uh, Minister of Interior, a fellow by the name of Andrei Milchanovsky, uh, who was actually a seminal character in forging the alliance, the intelligence alliance with the United States, and basically asked Milchanovsky if they have any dirt on the ex-communists. And Milchanovsky then tasks Marion Zaharsky, uh, again, an agent who was operating in Los Angeles, with trying to find proof that, that the communists were somehow still in bed with the Russians. And they conduct this investigation of the Polish, the, the communist, the, 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 the ex-communist prime minister at the time, Josef Oleksii, and they believe that they've collect evidence that he was actually a source uh, for the KGB. Uh, and Milchanovsky makes these allegations public 
in, in the SEM um, and accuses the prime minister of being a Soviet spy, or Russian spy. Um, but the, the allegations really don't stick. And it ends up sort of embarrassing for once. It makes him look like actually a sore loser. Um, it prompts really, Milcernovsky retires soon after that. Uh, and the allegations don't stick other than the fact that Alexei himself has to leave the scene. Um, generally speaking in Poland, I get the sense amongst talking to the intelligence professionals that Alexei was an incredibly vibrant, very talkative, very open schmoozer uh, who had friends everywhere, who drank with everyone, uh, but wasn't actually a Soviet or a Russian asset at all. And the allegations really didn't stick in the end. Uh, and they kind of sully the last months of Boense's campaign um, later on of Boense's career. And later on, of course, the current government now has been focused on trying to expose the fact that Valencia had collaborated with the S SB, with the, so with, with the communists back in the, in, in the early 70s and the middle 70s as well. So Valencia's reputation in Poland has taken a significant hit, both from um, the left, if you will, but also from the right. Yeah. This is tragic for, for a guy who was so yeah. critical to Poland's transition. Yeah, exactly. I mean, the, the evidence for his collaboration in the 70s is very strong. So unfortunately, by having denied it, he put himself into an untenable situation because if he just acknowledged it and had said, you know, I did my, I, I was under great pressure and I did my best to limit what I turned over, he probably would have been forgiven. But by digging in his heels and denying it, um, I think he really hurt himself a lot. Um, so the uh, it, it's it's very as you say it's very unfair that it's tarnished his whole reputation in Poland because um, you know he deserves great credit for his role in in uh, 1980 81 and in after throughout the 1980s. And then also during the roundtable as well. But I mean, yeah. Valencia's great Valencia's great characteristic is also his greatest flaw. It's just his sort of cussedness. And <laughs> it makes it difficult for somebody like him to, to, to compromise. Mm -hmm. and, and also, I should add one thing. He, he wasn't a great president. You know, he, his presidency was, yeah. um, you know, wasn't uh, exactly something to be proud of. So I think that also contributed. Yeah, the word shambolic comes to mind. Well, I, I think that that's certainly true in terms of accomplishment, but he did uh, take care of the leva noga. I mean, he said the uh, transition has to go on on two legs, a right leg and a left leg. Yeah. And I think his he, he provided the cover for giving ex-communists a stake in the new system. Yeah. Uh, so that they weren't uh, ca causing the kind of trouble that uh, the Macharevich and Naimsky uh, assumed they were or would. Um, so let me, uh, if I could, John, have you explain the title. The, uh, the, the subtitle is very, you know, very straightforward. The title itself from Warsaw with Love, um, I would like you to explain it. I know your father plays a role, so please. <laughs> So um, my, my, my dad, my late dad, actually, sadly, um, but he had a good life. He made it to 93, was, and, and I were ja are fans of James Bond. And so this is a complete ripoff, if you will, of the, the title of a, one of Bond's better movies from Russia with Love. And I wanted to express some of what I believe to be it's not the, the, one of the kernels in the relationship, back to, back to Tom's point, and one of the points I make in the book is that there was something um, between Poland and America that went beyond national interest, if you will. Um, you know, people have said that you know, we don't have friends, we just have interests. But with Poland and the United States, there was something in the relationship that went beyond that. Um, the Poles have a long tradition of supporting the United States. Um, the longest serving officer in the Continental Army was a Pole. Another Pole, Polish officer, arguably saved the life of George Washington. Um, the 13th of Woodrow Wilson's 14 points was an integral sovereign Poland with access to the sea. So this is a relationship that goes back literally centuries. 
And I wanted to give a flavor of that. And I also was fighting against an alternative title, which was a Warsaw Pact. And only <laughs> somebody, only Good. somebody who who knew and was familiar with Eastern European would understand kind of the joke there. Whereas I think the number of people who have watched James Bond movies versus the number of people who are familiar with Eastern European, I think there's more of them, more of the Bondies. And so we went with this and my dad also liked this a lot better. So there you have it. Yeah, good for you. Very good. Well, I, we're out of time. So let me um, thank both speakers very much. Um, John Pomfret, uh, Washington, uh, formerly of the Washington Post and um, author of this book, and uh, Ambassador Thomas Simons, who is now at Harvard University, uh, alumnus of Harvard as well, and um, and uh, an expert on Poland who has written about Poland. Um, so the two of you together, I think, have done a great job of presenting this important book. I hope people will go out and buy it. And uh, it really makes a great read. So it should that, fly off the show. Please talk. OK, great. Great to be with you. Great Thank again. you, Mark. Thank, Thank you. you, Tom. And thanks to the center. Thank you.